essentially the idea is that we gather together uh, some people who are thinking and doing incredible things to make change and um, provide 10 minutes each to give you a platform to share um, probably just a t small insight into some of those things um, that you're doing. Um, so we're hoping that we're going to be joined by a fourth speaker, Valentino, um, uh, who is, uh, they are on their way. So um, we're hoping uh, that they'll get here shortly. Um, but for now, it's just the four of us. And uh, so we have Tito Marley with us, Alison um, McKibben, and uh, Maisha Isha Sumar. Um, so I'm going to introduce and tell you a little bit about them um, just before they speak. Um, so I'm sure you're very familiar with the ground rules by now, having been here all day around um, we're going to strict, uh, strictly to our time, so we've got a bit of time for Q&A um, at the end. And also, uh, as with all of the sessions, uh, sensitive subjects uh, uh, may arise, so uh, we're very aware that people may need to leave and take a moment, so do feel free to do that. And there are um, qualified therapists and people to talk to down in the Grand Hall um, with the Survivors Trust. Uh, so, um, so without further ado, uh, Tito Marley is going to uh, speak first. Um, Tito is a former BBC journalist turned Big Issue Top 100 Changemaker campaigner and gender equality activist. She's a survivor and her courage in speaking out has been an inspiration for many around the world. She's currently at the Prince's Trust where she co-chairs PT Gen, the Trust Gender Equality and Women's Network, which seeks to make the Trust one of the best places to work for women and parents. In 2019, she was named Super Mum of the Year by Fabulous Magazine for her campaign, Make Childcare Work, alongside Save the Children. Can you please give a warm welcome to all of our speakers, and particularly Tito <laughs> first. Um, wow, thank you, Colette, <laughs> for the incredible introduction. Um, and as my intro alluded to, there's been many hats, or as I prefer to use the analogy of shoes. Um, I'm a huge fan of shoes, I've got lots of shoes. Um, so there's been many shoes that I've worn in my life, and particularly in my professional journey. And it's particularly the shoes that I wore in my journey and early career as a journalist is what's led me to sit here and speak to you today. So in 2013, I was raped on a work assignment. And in that moment, I lost everything. I lost firstly myself, or the sense of who I was from that point onwards. Um, it was really the beginning of the end of my career. Um, although I stubbornly sort of hung on, you're not taking that away from me as well. Um, but really profoundly, I lost the sense of safety. So up until that point, I was an arts and entertainment journalist. I would travel around Europe mostly, um, attending all the big festivals. Um, when I first started, I came in to a very male-dominated side of the industry, um, which was hip hop. Um, and so often I was the only woman on assignment, um, but I never felt unsafe. I actually felt quite protected by whilst it's a really large industry, it's actually very small. So you tend to see the same faces on the same circuit um, and felt very protected by what I'd call my big brothers in the industry. Um, and on the whole, had a really great reception from the predominant email artist that I would interview, barring one who refused to speak to me, but I think that was more about the fact that I was a woman. Um, and he assumed that I didn't know anything about the genre that I'd come to speak to him about, and, and perhaps, you know, saw me as a little bit of a dolly bird, because, you know, I did like to wear my heels and whatever, um, until I started speaking. And thankfully, he was part of a group, otherwise that would have been a really short interview, um, because for the first half, he wouldn't speak to me or acknowledge that I was even there, until he realized, oh, she knows what time it is, and she knows her stuff. Um, so I never felt unsafe. Um, I traveled alone, a lot, um, and really, I don't know, sort of was quite empowered I grew up not having a voice or feeling as though I didn't have a voice or certainly one that wasn't validated. Um, and to give you a bit of context around that, so I was born in the early 80s in South Africa, in Soweto, during apartheid um, as, a, as a black girl. So already the layers of that, I wasn't seen, I wasn't heard, I wasn't validated. So I think it's probably no coincidence that I went into an industry which was about telling stories 
um, giving people voices, um, and in particular for myself, probably seeking my own voice in that. Um, although when I was seven years old, I stood up on my primary school stage and declared that I wanted to be a lawyer. <laughs> um, not really understanding too much about that, but I think it's that sense of seeking justice. And again, actually, the two kind of go hand in hand because it's about presenting facts or details or evidence, but in a specific narrative. Um, so until that moment in 2013, I'd never really thought about my personal safety. I didn't really think about it being an issue that I spent most nights of the week backstage or in an audience somewhere or that I would be traveling around Europe on my own most of the time at festivals, um, being an on-site writer. I remember being asked to go and review Disclosure when they first came out and it was like, well, it's at 2 a.m. in this remote stage somewhere, but could you go off and do that? And not feeling any particular panic around that. Um, I think in preparation to this, I was kind of thinking about the definition of work because what I'm talking about is a very specific context um, to, to what happened to me and, and the space in which it happened. And really it's about you know, the things that we do, the tasks, the steps that we take in this journey to seeking some kind of purpose. Um, I know for myself, it definitely was linked with how I defined myself. So if people asked me to, you know, who are you? I'd often talk about what I did rather than who I was. And I think that's quite an easy thing to do. And then I also looked at the definition of safety. So this, pre you know, the prevention of harm or danger, but never really thought I had to think about the two things. I just took it as, well, clearly if I'm at work, I'm gonna be fine. That is where I should be protected. Um, in the media industry, or certainly after what happened to me, there was, there was a lots of things that kind of compounded it. So my perpetrator is a celebrity who has a person, you know, a very public persona. Um, so therefore there was already barriers around that. Um, and then even when I chose to sort of later disclose to one coworker, a, a female coworker actually, um, that I'd been working with for many years, because um, she was like, something's just not right with you. You, you just don't seem to be yourself, something's going on. And I explained what had happened. I quickly became characterized, or at least I felt I did, as the problem. We don't talk about this, we don't really know what to do with you. And I actually never worked with them again. So I never got booked for their show again. It was kind of like, maybe you should just take some time out. And you know, the phone just stopped ringing. Um, so I very quickly didn't talk about that experience with anybody else. And in fact, that protection around him and that kind of, I didn't feel that I could say anything. And also the fact that by saying this, I'm probably gonna end my career. And this is pre Me Too movement. So there wasn't like a collective voice of people saying, you know, this has happened to me, it's happened to me in this context, it's happened to me with this particular person. Although when I started researching into probably the stuff I might have, should have done rather than his accolades before interviewing him, it, it, I wasn't the first, I wasn't the last. Um, and now there's been a very different tone in the industry. So people are starting to come forward with their stories. He's, you know, bookings are starting to drop. Things are starting to happen. Um, but I couldn't, I didn't want to carry that burden by myself. One, I didn't think I'd be believed. Um, two, it was like, well, who am I? Who am I? in comparison to this person that's been put up here. And even when I've shared it with friends, it'd be like, really? Why, why would that person do that? Surely they can, you know, not understanding the dynamics of power um, when it comes to sexual violence. Um, now in my role, it's not really a big idea. It's actually something that I feel should have just been standard business as usual, but was actually horrified that it's not. Um, which is really around creating safe spaces in which to put this on the agenda and to talk about it. So I did like a you know quick bit of research, nothing that like journalism or anything else, just a literal qu quick Google search or YouTube and just sort of tapped in um, violence in the workplace. Just wanting to see what came up. Um, there was a lot on harassment and there was a lot on sexual harassment. There was a lot on kind of other forms of violence but very little that I found in that moment that specifically talked about sexual violence. Where would you go? How would you deal with it? How is it categorized? How do you even talk about it in that context? Um, so as the co-chair 
of the National Gender Equality Network for the charity that I work for, I've been very passionate about putting um, violence against women and girls and even men um, on the forefront of our agenda, that it shouldn't be a taboo subject, that it shouldn't be something that we simply talk about in terms of the young people, thank you, that we support, but actually that we should have a space to talk about the experiences of the people within the organisation. Um, I found myself just in the past two weeks sharing my experience very briefly with really senior people within the organisation. I'm talking about the chairman, director of fundraising, one of our donors even. Um, <laughs> and I've clearly got a long way to go in my journey still because my immediate response was to apologise. Well, I'm sorry, was that inappropriate? Should I have not have mentioned that? And I, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But one thing that I didn't feel was shame. I no longer felt the shame about being the survivor. Um, and really it's about creating more of that kind of dialogue. So we've kind of put it on the agenda for next year. Obviously 16 days of activism is happening at the moment. We put together some resources, but actually I think next year we want to do it in a really big way and kind of if it feels safe for people to disclose, but it's in those tiny conversations and acknowledgements that there's so many people that share that journey, that story, but it's still done quietly, privately, hushed, apologetically. And I want it to be a space where it's loud and proud. We are here, we need to change this. And also most importantly, we need policies in place when these things happen. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll end there, I think. Thank you so much for sharing that and good luck in Thank you. the <laughs> journey that you're taking with the Prince's Trust. Um, watch this space, I think, because yeah. it sounds <laughs> like you're at the beginning um, of, your of your journey. So we'll definitely be keeping in touch to find out how you, how you go. Thank you Thank so you. much. Can we give a round of applause to Tito? <laughs> Thank you. Um, and there'll be an opportunity to ask Tito any questions at the end. Um, next up, we have Alison McGibbon. Alison's a doctoral student and senior associate fellow with SHAME. Uh, she's part of the team who put together the festival today in partnership uh, with the WOW Foundation um, and studies at uh, the, the University of London, Birkbeck. Uh, her specific research confronts the way in which the US federal policy utilizes settler colonial discourses to reproduce sexual violence against Native American women. Uh, she also works uh, across the UK and the US with young people, focusing in particular on helping them to find a way to find their voices through advocacy. Uh, so really warm welcome, Alison, and over to you. Thank you so much. So um, I'm gonna take a step back and I'm not sharing um, my story of being a survivor, although I do identify as one. But I also am an academic, and I think that this festival is a great place to discuss how academia and activism come together, especially around such a sensitive subject like sexual violence. So, almost a decade ago, while I was working as an intern in Washington, D.C., I was listening as anti-violence advocates shared their stories with Congress, urging them to expand the Violence Against Women Act. Sharon Assatoyer, the director of the Native American Women's Health Education Resource Center, pulled this children's book from her bag and started reading. She said, A is for all you will face as a Native girl. B, because as a Native girl, you are more than three times as likely to be raped. C, currently nine out of 10 Native girls have been forced to have sex when they don't want to. This is called What to Do When You're Raped an ABC handbook for Native girls, and it's published by Assatoyer's organization in 33 indigenous languages. It describes how to get resources for STI testing and explains the US laws that will allow virtually all of their attackers to avoid prosecution. Assatoyer was urging Congress to expand the Violence Against Women Act so that there would be more tribal resources, but also to close those jurisdictional loopholes Native girls face. She closed by saying, for Native girls, this book is for not if you are raped, but when you are raped. That hearing single-handedly changed my life. In 2018, I completed a master's degree in US history, and it focused on documenting stories of activism 
from Native scholars who had been working to establish a grassroots indigenous shelter network all across the United States. But then an opportunity arose for me to publish that research, and I felt so overwhelmed with indecision. I had truly spent years talking to Native women and documenting their amazing feat, and I believe it should be in the public record and be celebrated. But I had also spent that time reading indigenous scholarship by Sarah Deer, Audra Simpson, and Sandy Grand that told me that these were not my histories to tell. So I chose not to publish my research. As a white middle-class woman who was raised on the stolen lands of the Osage people, I knew that I could not intimately know those histories, the vibrant cultures, or the terrorizing colonial violence. My research was shared only with the indigenous advocates and communities that helped contribute to it. But still, I received my degree, and in part, my current PhD placement at Birkbeck based on that writing. I personally profited off of the stories Native women told me about their violence and activism. And I honestly, I, I don't know how best to compensate or provide reparations for that. But that is what I wanna talk to you about today. This idea of true activism and allyship in academia. When I started this journey, I truly didn't know what I was getting into, but I believe that academia doesn't have to be inaccessible. So please don't zone out if you're not an academic because I still struggle to feel like one all the time. This festival demonstrates that activism and academia are not separate worlds, and I don't believe that they should be. So in the next few minutes, I'm gonna provide a very brief scholarly perspective on allyship and activism. And then I'm going to share my own not as big ideas about how we get past that and turn critical theory into actual activist practice. There are literally hundreds of academic theories about allyship, and most of them come from critical gender and race scholars, but fundamentally they all argue for differing levels of engagement for white scholars, or more broadly, those outside of marginalized groups who are researching marginalized communities and experiences. The history of anthropology, geography, history, and literally every other discipline of academia involves taking race and gender and making a classification of the other. Then we use this group that we call the other to either explicitly oppress or implicitly misrepresent those populations. Academia is responsible for so much of the violence, both gender and racialized, that we face today. And I want to be clear in saying that white feminist authors played an enormous role in this violence. They argued that simply by being women, they were entitled to write about all minoritized populations and represent them. And that is irresponsible and violent. However, black indigenous and scholars of color have pushed back against this problematic practice, which in academia we call epistemic violence, or the damage done by the ways we create and disseminate knowledge. I don't have time to explain this literature, and honestly, it's not super interesting. But I think there are two theories we should briefly highlight because they're relevant to activism. First, Kimberly Crenshaw coined intersectionality, which a lot of you may have heard of, or the idea that we all exist at different intersections of our identities, be it race, gender identity, sexuality, class, or disability. And at each of these intersections, we have different experiences that create distinct views on life that are different from one another. Second, Sandra Harding coined standpoint theory, or the idea that all knowledge is created from those social standpoints. So no form of the humanities, or even science, is truly objective. Rather, all of our research is inherently political. Together, these two theories tell us that all knowledge is created by people, and people have diverse beliefs, experiences, and backgrounds that necessarily inform their ideas and create biases within their research. Okay, so what do we do with all of these abstract ideas? 
I'm going to present my ideas mixed in with my own experience as allyship because it's what I know best. But I want to be clear, these aren't new, but I think they're important to ensure that academia is more radically activist. So first, consider your position and don't exploit trauma. I want to be clear that we all need to use our privilege to support movements that do not directly involve us. But I'm here talking about academics, authors, and artists who are working with movements or using them as material for their studies. We must stop using other groups' oppression for our personal or professional benefit. For me, this meant shifting my research to confronting violent US laws. My government is inflicting violence directly on indigenous women through legislation that it claims is there to protect them. That is something that I know and can fight. However, it also goes past this. I must acknowledge my position and my privilege throughout my work, both in academia and in activism, and self-problematize what I do, asking throughout my research, what assumptions am I making without realizing it? And how do those have real effects for women in other parts of the world? Second, I think it's important to read, understand, and amplify marginalized voices. In my work, I cite and center indigenous authors to add context to my arguments. It is important that we read authors from inside movements and then take them back to our own communities of privilege to amplify their voices, not our own. Third, we need to reject and redirect. Here I'm talking to white women. It is a form of violence and erasure for us to accept opportunities to speak on behalf of other groups. Redirect organizations to advocates from within communities of color, disabled collectives, and LGBTQ groups. Work collaboratively to bring in those resources, but don't try and lead a movement that isn't yours. I follow and support pre-established groups like Decolonize Myself and the Indigenous Women Rising Fund because I know that Instagram does not need another page about decolonization run by a white woman. Finally, do the work outside the academy. It is so important to get involved at a grassroots level. For example, money speaks, and it's most impactful when given directly. For me, this has meant contributing to mutual aid funds for indigenous women who are fighting back against sexual violence. But I've also recently learned the importance of using my own white bodily privilege to protect others at protests. Honestly, I don't know how we do academia or activism right in a world that genuinely feels like it's going so wrong. And I think it's important to acknowledge that we're all works in progress, from scholars to activists. But going forward with open hearts and critical, honest engagement with ourselves will allow us to listen to others and find where and how we can make the most difference. I want to close with a challenging reminder from Latina feminist scholar Linda Martine Alcoff's The Problem of Speaking for Others, the piece of writing that truly transformed how I thought about activism and academia. She writes, the practice of speaking for others is often born of a desire for mastery, to privilege oneself as a champion of a just cause and achieve glory and praise. The impetus to speak must be carefully analyzed and in many cases, and certainly for academics, fought against. If one's immediate impulse is to teach rather than to listen to a less privileged speaker, we should resist that impulse and interrogate it at all costs. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alison. Such a lot to unpack in that um, 10 minutes. And I believe you're still in, um, I think your first year of your PhD, so l lots more to do. Um, but yeah, what's so brilliant and hopefully shameless is the uh, start of um, finding ways for this quality of that thinking to be shared much more widely in um, public with audiences and for much wider conversation. 
Um, so I'm sure lots of you will have really good questions to ask uh, Alison at the end. So thank you. Thanks again. Uh, next we have Maisha. Um, Maisha is an advocate who, through sharing her personal story, inspires, empowers and influences thousands of individuals through her platform, She Walks in Value, which you can find on Instagram. She's an activist raising issues around domestic violence, mental health uh, and more in the House of Lords, in Parliament and also is working with the NHS. Um, as well as being a motivational speaker in schools, university and at events, many events uh, like this one uh, today. Um, she's been listed within the 50 most inspiring black women in the UK and just in the last two years alone has won 13 awards. Uh, welcome, Maisha. Thank you so much. That was such a lovely introduction. I'm really honoured to be here today, um, especially with these phenomenal women. It's honestly uh, a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to be sharing my story um, and also how I was to how I am today. And then we'll have time for some questions and answers. I can talk quite a bit. <laughs> so if those that are keeping time, like when I get to five minutes, just sign me so that I know to get to the next part. <laughs> Um, so a bit, a bit about my story. Um, so originally I'm from Sierra Leone, which is in West Africa. And at the time there was the war happening, which is uh, in regard to the diamonds and stuff. So we ended up fleeing um, from the war. And I was about maybe like nine months, so I don't remember much in Sierra Leone. And then we saw so I ended up in Holland, which is um, in the Netherlands. And growing up, everything was quite fine. Uh, growing up, you know, it was me, my siblings, my parents. But soon after, there was starting to be a lot of violence in the household. So I remember the first time when I saw an incident was when I went outside to play. And you know when you just come back inside for that water break because you've just been running. And I remember my mum being locked in the basement. And I just remember her hands being tied. She had a yellow plastic bag covered around her head. Um, and her eyes were just red. And it was like a see-through bag. And I remember she couldn't speak, but I know she'd be crying. Like You could just see it in her face. And I just remember my father... I um, don't know if it was a bell or a stick, I don't remember exactly, but I just remember it being brown and him holding that and just saying, oh, go back outside because I went to look in to why my mom was in the basement tied up like this. But because you're, I'm, I was really, really young, you're a child, you just, you, you know something's wrong, but you just go back outside and you just continue. But that moment, it was almost like throughout this journey, I was carrying a suitcase, but it was like an invisible suitcase. But in that suitcase, the same way that you pack for when you go on holiday, I was now packing trauma and all the other things that was being packed into that suitcase as I was going on my journey. Um, so then, soon after that, I started to see that my father wasn't around, so he was, like, cheating. And it was, like, no kind of, like, that loyalty in, the, in our household, so this started to cause quite a division. So um, then I was also going to school, and I was experiencing a lot of racism because I was black. So I remember in school, I hated being a young black girl um, because people would spit on me. People would call me names like a gorilla, monkey, or, like, at the time when I had braids, um, like what I have on my head now, people would be like, oh, how did you stick that on? Was it with glue? And it was just questions that were very disgusting. Uh, people just didn't want to be my friend because I was black, so people would, like, comment on my features. So I could be very insecure about my nose, about my lips, because they were big um, compared to the rest of them. So I was going through a lot of bullying uh, because of this. And no one wanted to be my friend. I would sit alone in class. Um, and I was just really sad with him because I was just like, why does no one want to be my friend? Like, why is everyone treating me like this because of what I look like or because of the skin color of my skin? Um, and then when I went home, there was constant violence. So eventually, um, again, I, like I was saying, I was getting bullied in school. Um, even in school, like I remember I was in like the top set when I got put down because my teacher said, you cannot be smarter than the white kids. So for me, um, and I remember my mom came into school by and stuff, but it was just like, they would threaten me with it, like, oh, if you laugh too much in class, or if you don't behave, we're just going to send you back and you won't be forward. So it was a lot of these kind of things that started to affect my confidence. So someone that was really bubbly, a little pop girl, my confidence became even more like, um, I don't know the right word to use for it, but to, like, it started to decrease, basically. And then we had now moved to the city because the violence in the household was getting really bad. Um, and also the way I was being treated in school. So my mom wanted us to move to a different city so I could just get like a fresh start. Moved to the city and I thought, okay, cool. I'm going with this invisible suitcase. I've moved on. But what I didn't understand was that you can move from place to place. But if you don't deal with the stuff that's within you, 
that trauma will follow you and it will manifest in different ways. So this is what happened. I now moved to a city um, in Stowe in Holland and then my parents started fighting even more. So I would literally see my dad beating up my mom. She would have bruises, she would be bleeding um, and I would hear him like rape her next door at night. So I couldn't sleep at night. That's when I started to suffer from really bad insomnia and I started having really bad panic attacks. Um, started suffering from schizophrenia at such a young age. I would see like black shadows or like someone would be there or I would hear voices or um, when I went to bed, I'd feel like I was being choked and I couldn't breathe. So there was a lot of things uh, mentally and you could say quite spiritually that was going on with me because of the violence that I was seeing at home. And then it even got to the point where uh, my mom ended up having a miscarriage because my dad was really abusive. And I remember literally just seeing my mom have a miscarriage and I'm probably, if not eight, or something so really really young and I remember seeing that and my mom was pregnant with twins and only one so my little brother is about 11 now um, that survived because my dad pushed my mom into the river um, so there was a lot of violence my I would literally see like my dad um, choking my mom and literally trying to murder her in front of us and trying to get involved we would get hit um, so it was really really bad and then um, again the violence was getting worse my dad was using like all the money on drugs so my mom was pregnant the baby wasn't moving some days um, we would have to go to the neighbors to be able to have a shower to have um, hot water to be able to eat like we used to use candles literally to be able to have some heat not heating but light and then it would get to that point where you only have one more candle in the box and you're just wondering what then um, so this abuse continued for quite a while it was really bad um, and then I also sorry I forgot um, when I was like before we moved to the city um, I was sexually assaulted by my dad's best friend um, and that led to me becoming very promiscuous and I became very sexual at such a young age so I matured I was really mature but not mature because you matured but because of that trauma and then um, again the abuse was getting really bad my dad would literally go at night and would hear him in the cupboard looking for knives and forks to try and stab my mom and kill my mom or attack her so it was we couldn't sleep like imagine I was failing in school everyone in school was bullying me I had no friends you come home you come to look for that love but I didn't have any of that so eventually we managed to flee so that's how I'm here now in the UK so we fled because the abuse was too much and, and my mom could see how it was impacting us so when I got here um, about first year again I started to get bullied again because English is my fifth language so when I came here um, a lot of people was like making jokes about my accents and stuff like that so in that moment it was like survival mode I'm not going to be bullied again I now have to put on a wall or like a mask and pretend to be this bad girl so that no one would step to me so then in year I'm year eight now I'm 13 I started hanging out with the wrong crowds gang members I was gonna get arrested um, I was constantly getting into fights because I didn't know how to control my emotions. Um, so I was always getting into fights and stuff. And then um, this led to me, again, like I was saying, almost getting arrested. And I started developing really bad addictions um, just being 13. And then I would self-harm. And I even tried to commit suicide eight times um, only being 13 because I just hated life. Like, I just didn't understand why I was here. I didn't see my purpose. Um, and this continued. And I would always go, like, partying, raving just to get away from my reality because my depression at this moment of time had gotten really bad. So for me, it couldn't be me and my, like, four walls. I would literally have emotional breakdowns and I was just suffering a lot. Um, and then eventually, again, because now my friends had set me up to get gang raped at a party. So, and this is again, still being 13. So I had a lot of insecurities. People were trying to set me up. So then again, my mom had to move me to South London because when I came to the UK, I was in Northwest London. So I now moved thinking, okay, I can start a fresh start. I'm away from everything. I can stop being fake in a sense of pretending to be someone that I wasn't. Because if you told me who I was, that's who I would be. Like my personality would change around people because I never had like a stable character and who I was because it was always dedicated by who you wanted me to be um, so I now moved to South London things were starting to move a bit forward um, and about 16 now I got into an abusive relationship um, where my ex um, tried to attempt to, to murder me on three different occasions from being thrown off the 20th floor literally in Clapham Junction so even coming here today was such a big step um, being able to be here but it is safe for me to be here um, and yeah so that almost happened I always got stabbed bricked thrown into a river um, I was raped and that's literally how my virginity was taken and this happened in 2016 um, and so that was like the worst day of my life and a lot of things continued to happen from physical abuse from him trying to get me pregnant so that I would never leave him this is what he would say and stalking me calling me like 128 times in a day and it was just really bad my depression got worse my life was like such a mess but then it got to a point where I almost died 
in my house. Um, and thank God the neighbors had heard, so they'd call the police. And in that moment of time, I realized that I wanted to change my life around. I understood that just because I had a bad background, it didn't mean that I needed to leave my back on the ground, that actually my past is to determine the woman that I can be. So I remember the first step was acknowledgement. I had to put a mirror in front of my face and literally say, my Shah, you have been raped. Because for me, that was hard growing around gang members, having these olders, um, culture as well. I was a young black girl, it was kind of hard to open up and stuff. So for me, I had to really break, I wouldn't call it pride, but to get to reality that this is a real issue and the only way I can actually heal and recover is when I face who I have been all this while. So I remember it took me a few months to heal. It was a lot of tears. It was ugly. <laughs> really having to go to those root causes from my childhood to, you know, all the other things that unfortunately I had been carrying in this suitcase. I had to really unload that suitcase emotionally speaking. And when I had done that, I was able to finally find myself. I was like free from that trauma in that sense. Um, I'm not perfect, but I generally have peace. Like I no longer suffer from the anxiety, the, de the depression, um, for wanting to kill myself um, and just where I was like my mindset has changed Amash is not who she, what she does because a lot of people sometimes think their identity comes from what they do but that's separate who I am and what I do are two different things and today I love myself I'm genuinely happy um, I'm at peace my brand is doing really well as well I've been given loads of opportunities and only being 23 like I never thought I would get to the point where I am today because I was just kind of like um, teachers would just say you're just going to end up um, not doing much in life, basically. You might as well, like, they would take me to those job fairs because they didn't think I would get into university, which I did. They didn't think I could have my own brand. They didn't think I could do the things that I can do today. Um, so, you know, I'm just basically using my voice, freeing other people by sharing my story, going into schools, like I was saying, um, and just creating that change because I believe that change starts with you. For me, I was always the kind of person, I didn't like complaining. If I saw that I wanted to change something, I would go into those doors, opportunities. I started going to parliament at 19. People used to look at me, here's this girl, what's she coming here to do? Because I was really gay, right? But I didn't care because I understood what I had to add didn't mean I was less because of my color or because of how I spoke or because of how I looked. So I remember I would go there and I've been doing a lot of works with MPs as well and stuff. So yeah, my life has changed, but most importantly, with everything that I have done, um, the most important thing that I have found is myself. Like, I know what color I like. I know what I love eating. I need to kind of stop that. But, because <laughs> my PT is right over there. But, um, <laughs> I, you know, I'm generally happy. And, it, and my happiness doesn't come from the things that I've achieved or from the things that I've done. It comes from who I am within. So I just want to leave you guys with that regardless of what you have gone through, Take the decision today to take charge of your life because we can't keep giving other people the pen to write our story. If other people in your life, in a particular moment in your life, whether childhood or even in your recent adult years have been writing your story for you, throw that book away. Don't even open to look at it unless you're going there to literally take that power that you felt that you lost in that moment of time. Take that back, write your story because you earn your story, you earn your life and it's time for us to start taking that responsibility, not because it should be your burden but because we deserve that peace. You deserve that happiness and that happiness is possible just as we have shared um, our stories and some of the work that you've been doing. It is possible so, you know, your journey might look different, your healing will be different but you can get there and I really believe that you guys can do it because it wasn't no less for me like where I came from I would have never thought that I could achieve or do this but I have been able to do it so yeah I hope I did all right for time because I saw her walking <laughs>
does anybody have anything that they would like to ask our panelists? Um, how much time do we have, Laura? We've got about 10 minutes, I think. Nobody? Well, maybe I could just start you off because in, in oh, sorry, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> Um, difficult is we this is a great platform where we're sharing ideas and being present but it's a shame that it's not an equal representation of the population because that's also what I felt um, just you mentioned it doesn't matter what you do for work but just to give you a background what I do for work and then for um, in my spare time so I work in the financial industry, so often it's um, male dominated, but also I don't want to speak against the male population because I have many male colleagues who are amazing and male friends who's amazing. So, but at the same time in my spare um, job, I am an advisor for the World Smart Cities Forum. And when we organize conferences, I noticed that um, Often it's mostly men as the leaders representing, and I feel we need to unite together the gaps, that it's not just one team rep, you know, complaining or one mm. representation of a group of them making a decision that's not right or fit for everybody. I really believe platform like this, but then connect with everybody else to communicate, I think that's how we could build a better future. Mm -hmm. And I really liked what you all mentioned about that where each individual have the power to change. And I loved how you said, you know, what you do for a job or your job title, it's, it doesn't define you, it's who you are inside and about you that, you know, sometimes some people don't have the voice, but you unite to give them a voice and then everybody's educated together and I'm so happy to be here present and hopefully afterwards we could exchange numbers to collaborate yeah. and then it would be a better um, if we are building uh, smart cities then all of our feedback is fed back not just one group of people mm. that's how I feel thank yeah, you thank you very much I mean it's been a theme across the day um, in the sessions, uh, uh, particularly around how you include men in the conversation, actually, more and more. Um, and uh, in one of the sessions I was at earlier, I can't remember the academic's name, but um, one of the speakers cited uh, a, a, a woman who talked about calling in as well as calling out or instead of calling out and, and finding spaces for men in particular to work out amongst themselves how they're going to help and what their bit is going to be in, um, uh, in, in the campaign. Uh, so thank you for that. And also, um, it is part of what the WOW Foundation is all about, actually. It's about bringing all of those voices together into a space where we can meet each other and share different expertises, different lived experience and different ideas, actually, about how to go forward together um, and I don't know I'm sure you all know about the wild festival in March around International Women's Day and women in tech actually is often a big subject there so <laughs> lots of interesting um, contributions thank you did any of you have anything that you would like to respond thank you so much um, for sharing and actually it um, was a really important factor when we we're putting together the Gender Equality Network because up until the beginning of this year, it actually wasn't called the Gender Equality Network. It was actually called the Network of Women. Mm. <laughs> and the reason that it changed um, was actually because of probably our biggest male ally, who's our CEO. So he was actually the sponsor of the network. And we really talked about the fact that we needed our male colleagues on the journey with us in order to see the changes that we wanted to see within the workplace, but equally, what's transformed from that because we literally have within our objectives we have sort of male allyship leads um is actually creating safe spaces for men as well 
So we had a men Get Men's Talking Week. It was recently International Men's Day, and we really sort of highlighted that. But the sort of also having that joint platform. So we launched a uh, pregnancy loss policy. But what was interesting about the panel for that, it wasn't just women talking about baby loss, but we actually had our male colleagues on that panel as partners as well in their experiences. And I, I really share that view that we kind of have to all come together um, in order to drive forward that change and that understanding as well and that sort of learning moment um, and peace. Because I don't want to be against my male colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, some of them have been my biggest champions. You know, and I said that even within my journalism career. So I don't want to let one man's actions define what's n been great work and allyship by other men. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to yeah. reiterate that. Yeah, I think that's possibly a way forward. Thank you, Sophie. Thanks. I don't know more mic is mic. Um, any further questions from the audience? Yeah, yeah please. Um, thank you so much for sharing, particularly your really, um, yeah, uh, hard-hitting um, story from your past. And <coughs> I guess my question was, um, for many of us who may be supporting friends or loved ones who have had difficult experiences, I rarely come across someone who's so resilient as you and, and can kind of overcome and snap out of a really desperate situation. Um, so that's incredible that you've managed to experience that. I'd, I'd love to hear more about it, whether there was sort of spiritual elements or um, other things that helped you. But for those of us who maybe are walking alongside or maybe even in ourselves, find ourselves revisiting bad habits or not able to find that trajectory so um, easy to follow towards hope, towards um, a different path, towards new opportunities and healing and restoration, where we find um, people that fall back into bad habits or that they maybe re, um, they find themselves in desperate place for a long, long time and it's a longer journey. Um, what maybe uh, advice or thoughts would you give to some people that might be struggling with a, a lot of a, a longer journey? I'm not saying yours hasn't been long, I'm sure it has, but it sounded a, like an amazing transformative experience that you had, which we wish many other people could also have. Um, so I think that's like two questions in one. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think the first one, like, yeah, my healing definitely was, apart from acknowledgement, spiritual, that was the main thing for me. Um, I know it's different for everyone else, but for me, my relationship with God was important. That was foundation. Um, that's the only reason why I come across the way I do. Um, I used to be someone that was very, like, like, suffering from a lot of anxiety, really, like, thinking everyone's judging me, everyone's looking at me a certain way, and stuff like that. I was someone that was not confident at all. Um, but that came from my relationship with God, where I was able to, like, mirrorize how God saw me. So that really helped me to see, okay, this is, it was like a reference that, okay, even though my, because my dad was very abusive um, verbally, like, he said horrible stuff to me, right? Um, that I wouldn't, like, you know, do good in school, I was just going to be like a dropout, I was going to be a prostitute, all this kind of stuff. But when I started looking to how God saw me, and that God told me that I was someone that is valuable, I started to work towards that, and, I, and it was faith. Because faith is not just when you have a religious belief. Faith is believing in something you don't see yet. So I was manifesting that and empowering on that, if that makes sense. So for me, uh, faith played a huge part. Without my faith, I don't think I would have been where I am today. In regards to how to support friends and... Um, you know, if you're on that journey and maybe it might not happen straight away, um, time is a beautiful thing. Um, but it's also what you do in that time. Because in that time of healing and recovery, um, the time that I had, I really invested. It was all or nothing. I had to change my spirit, if that makes sense. Because everyone has a different, as you can see, we all have different personalities. But in regards to our spirit about being passionate against sexual violence, it is the same. So your spirit is something that you feed that you don't necessarily see, but it's how kind of like your attitude and your mindset is. So I think it is possible, and I believe it is possible. Um, everyone's journey is obviously different. So in regards to how you can support your friends, it's just by listening, by believing them, validating them, and knowing that their journey that they might be high one day, might be low one day, um, but just keep listening and being there to comfort them. Um, and even though I come across how I come across, 
there's hard days. Like, I remember I met you at um, the reception that we had for the Shameless Festival. And even the day before, uh, my father that I hadn't seen for eight years was right outside my street. Um, and, you know, how when I live in Southwest and he lives all the way in the East, it didn't make sense. And my mom had not left my house long ago. And he tried to attack my mom. And my mom called me. So imagine the day before you do such a, ma a massive talk because um, the Duchess of Cornwall was there. So that was obviously like a huge milestone for me. And I remember I, that's my best friend, by the way. Um, she had taught me. Um, and I remember calling her. I cried. I didn't go to bed till three in the morning. Um, it was hard because it was my mom. That scream that she screamed on the phone, it took me back to my childhood. So even though I come across strong, which I am, which is again comes from my faith um i have hard moments like that was a really hard moment for me because i could have i remember i was not gonna go i was like i'm not turning up literally like, i was like this is too much how can i go and speak to this woman about hope when i've just experienced something like this but i feel like you are strong when you go through the harder situations but in a sense of you don't have to go through hard situations to be strong but sometimes people think strength is when you're always standing it takes a lot of strength when you're down and you have to find that energy to keep coming back up and then up so i think that's one thing to maybe tell your friends, or if anyone here is thinking, I've tried this journey so many times, I feel like I'm not getting anywhere, I'm not where I need to be yet, keep sowing, it's not in vain, you might not see it, but that's where your faith comes in, that's where you change your mindset, that I'm not seeing where I am yet, or where the woman that I want to be, but it is possible, and time, um, don't let time be your enemy, let time be like your best friend, literally, because as you continue to invest in that time, you will get to that point, but it's about changing your mindset, and not allowing your physical eyes to stop you from reaching where your spiritual eyes can see that you can't go in, but it's all about continuously investing, because you're going to go through hardships, had I not invested in myself, I would have probably not even been here today, um, you know, or even having to come back to this area, I got raped not far from here, like Clapham Junction, that's where uh, my abuser lives, so imagine getting ready this morning, coming here, some people think, okay, she speaks like this, she speaks like that. But even that, it takes strength. Um, so, again, like, it's when you are put in these kind of situations, you really see your strength, and that strength is birthed, and that produces patience, and it produces that strength. I don't know if that answered, yeah? Okay. I'd just like to add a little bit to that. So you said something that really struck me, which is, like, it's amazing how resilient these two women are on the stage, and they are, but I think it's really important to realize that resilience is, is, isn't something we should have to be. It's something that we've had to become because of society. But when you see in yourself that lack of resilience or in your friends, like that's okay because the situation you've been put in as becoming a survivor in that instance is not normal. And it is normalized in our society because it is a society where sexual violence has become normal. And all of your responses are normal. But what happened to you or to your friends is not normal. And it's okay to not be on the path towards what you see or society has told you is right. And I think that's the second thing is I'm, I'm also a survivor. And for me, it took me years to admit, much like what you said, that I was a survivor of what had happened to me. But be kind to yourself in those moments. Like, accept that you're going to make mistakes, accept that your friends will make mistakes, and exactly what you said, like, be the listening ear, but also be the reflection to them that what happened to them wasn't normal, and we shouldn't allow them to see one path towards healing, because healing is never linear, and there's always going to be those bumps, and in every situation, I truly believe that we have to question the narratives about sexual violence we hear, which is what this festival is about. That sexual violence isn't, I survived correctly, because none of us did, but we're alive, and that's honestly a miracle. Thank you, Alison and Raisha. Um, I think we've got time for one more question, yeah. Uh, did you have one too? We'll take two, yeah. <laughs> Hi, thank you so very much for sharing um, so much of your lives. And I think um, listening to you, what really struck me was the power that you have and uh, using your voice. And you said a lot about your voice and uh, telling your story. Um, I just want to hear a little bit more about how you invest. And I think, Mayusha, you were talking about investing in yourself. How did you invest in yourself? And I mean, what was the process? of investing in yourself? Because I think it comes to a turning point where you make that decision and what are the steps that you took 
in order to invest uh, in yourself. Because I do a lot of work with uh, young people too, and I'm really interested, for example, um, Tith Tutu and your work with Princess Trust, and I know they work a lot with vulnerable girls and, and boys. Um, and I'll be interested in seeing how you're going to use that, because mentoring is also one critical way in which you can sort of give uh, to others, and I just want to know what are some of the things that you're doing, or some of the things that you can share with us around this journey, around uh, support and mentoring and uh, investments in yourself. Thank you. Tito, did you want to take that? Thank you so much. I'm a big advocate for mentoring as well, and actually uh, I'm a woman of the world mentor. So I've, I've done like the speed mentoring piece. Um, in terms of just trying to think about the work that I did um, on myself to be able to be here today, um, at the beginning there was no work. There was just the, the bare bones of survival, really. It's probably taken me all these years, we're talking eight years later, to even be able to say the word rape and to own that experience and uh, as these ladies have shared, to say that I'm a survivor without the shame. Um, I've got a tattoo on my wrist, um, which you can't see because I've got my band over it, <laughs> um, but it actually says, by the grace of God. Um, I couldn't put the whole thing, by the grace of God, go I, but it comes back to that purpose piece that I spoke about earlier. So rather than defining my life based on what I do as being my purpose, the fact that I'm alive showed me that there must be a purpose to why I'm here. Um, similar to Marisha, I actually tried to take my life, so I shouldn't be here at all. Um, I didn't talk about in my story about ending up in an institution because of it, um, but it was that glimmer of hope. So my son, who I never thought that I would have because I never thought I'd become a mother, I never thought that I'd be engaged, I never thought I'd be a partner, none of those things, um, wasn't necessarily an intentional thing. It was like the little steps every single day to healing. So even celebrating the small wins, um, like we've, be, we've, it's been talked about our accolades, but some days just being able to get out of bed, you know, and do the simple self-care is a big win. Um, so I think in regards to sort of supporting young people, one of the things I really want to build in place is that, you know, this isn't our speciality or our wheelhouse. So certainly that came up when Sarah Everard had passed away um, or was murdered, let's just call it what it is. Um, we were asked for an organizational response, but it's really about putting in place those specialist support mechanisms um, and referral partners and safe spaces that we can say we may not know. Um, another big investment that we want to do is actually training our frontline staff to recognize um, perhaps the sort of subtle signs or signposting, that kind of thing, because that's not currently in our training. Um, yeah, I don't know if I've answered that particularly well, <laughs> um, but I don't know, Marisha or... Um, that's a great, I know you're engaged, congratulations. Alice, you look over to you, like. Um, I would say invested. Um, it, I, that's a lovely question. I've never actually been asked that question, so that's a beautiful question. And it actually has me thinking. Um, I say again, first way of investing was investing in the word of God, because um, that was my foundation. Um, so investing in meditating and speaking to God, like that really helped me um, to understand again my value. Like that's even where my brand, She Walks in Value, came from, because I started walking in purpose. I started walking in value. I started walking in confidence. I started focusing on how I wanted to walk, not just how I physically walked, but how I mentally walked. So I think investing a lot in my mental health and my mental well-being in a sense of the things I would pour into myself, because the same way you wouldn't let someone, like let's say there was poison in this, in this water. It's not because I drank it. <laughs> I was going to be like, oh, no. <laughs> but the same way I wouldn't take that, it's the same way I wouldn't take rubbish that was trying to be poured inside of me through conversations, through things that I was watching, through things that I was listening. So investing in yourself means understand that you're a valuable person physically, but also internally and protecting that. That's what helps me to... Um, I would say when you invest, there was obviously things that I did like positive affirmations. Again, that's faith. Um, again, because you, you, you're, for example, I remember I wanted to be a woman that like respected myself because I didn't respect myself because I was disrespected a lot through the way I was violated, um, through the violence that I experienced. And I remember I wasn't that girl that respected themselves, but I remember I would look in the mirror or put post-it notes because you know like when you do Jesus, um, 
go to uh, university and stuff. And I remember I would literally write, I am a woman of value. I am a woman that respects herself. And I would believe in it until I saw it. Like, I would look myself in a mirror. And I still do that today. I think this week I had quite a difficult week. And I remember just literally looking into my eyes. And they looked proper light round. You know, they're like that round. But I'm just staring in a mirror. And, I just, and it wasn't even physically out, but it was in my mind. I was like, Masha, you're such a powerful human being like you really are you have so much power within yourself and it's about how you utilize that so i think sometimes separating those moments is the moments that you take to invest in yourself when no one sees you those are the most powerful moments because it's not because you're doing it because a b and c is there or because it's a duty it becomes something that's natural so there's different ways that you can invest in yourself like taking care um, physically you know sometimes i just need to go out with the girls put on some heels look cute like stuff like that also helps you in investing yourself because you're showing love to your body like sometimes um, when i feel like i've been so so busy i after taking a bath the way i would rub cream on my body show love like take time it's the small details it's the things that sometimes people don't see that i would like pull that love back, love back into my skin, if that makes sense. Um, and it's just like things I do, like I might anoint my lips. I know it sounds crazy, but literally in a sense of like what comes out of my word holds power, what comes out of my, my mouth is value. So it's about creating that space for yourself. Like when I was saying to you earlier, it's what it looks like for you or your friend, because the things I do, my friend over there, she does something different, if that makes sense. So it's more about finding yourself. Once you find yourself, it will become a bit easier to find what works for you because then it's your purpose it's in line and it holds more power when it's you and not what I do if that makes sense but those are like some of the things that you can do and maybe some other stuff but yeah have you got time for one more question for Laura one yeah <laughs> yeah and um, thank you for sharing your experiences because this has been incredibly insightful and, and obviously very impactful I suppose I was actually thinking about something that you were saying around Googling sexual violence in, in a corporate environment and nothing coming up. And I was actually thinking about, you know, as three women on the stage, you represent quite a cross section. You've got the, the kind of professional world, the academic world, and obviously like family and wider society. And I got me thinking about my own experiences, you know, in, in the world of where I work, which is very corporate and there is no discussion of sexual violence. When I was at university, there was no discussion of sexual violence. When I think about, you know, interacting with my friends and, and colleagues, there's no discussion of sexual violence. So I guess in terms of turning this into practical steps that we can take as allies to, to create change, whether it's in business or at university or with family and friends, what are the steps that we can have uh, that we can take to start this conversation with the people around us? Yeah, I just want to jump in quickly here. Um, so I think that there are two big things. I think socially is the most important place we start having these conversations because what we say at work does matter, but I, I genuinely believe it happens through the connection you have with a person. So um, I spend a lot of my time talking to teenagers about this, which I think also speaks back to your question about what do we do with young people? And we have to talk to boys, young boys about consent and about um, cultures of sexuality, about their own sexuality, because how many of them come to me and tell me that they have felt pressured around sexuality as well? So for me, I think men all the way from 16 to 96 need to be talking to their friends about consent. And I know this is like something people always say and never do, but the like one thing I want to hammer home is like, the, the words that your friends use, both male, female, non-binary, around sex and sexuality matter. And that's where their opinions in the workplace come from. And so I just really wanna hit home about um, calling in your friends when you hear something problematic. I really don't think it's helpful to tell someone what you said is problematic, and then that's the end of the conversation because that shuts it down for them. So how do we call them in? We explain to them why that was both uncomfortable for you or hurtful to someone else. And by doing that, you're creating a conversation, but you also have to be willing to draw the line somewhere. And I think it's something we don't do with sexual violence enough. So to answer your question, I think in the workplace, you have to draw the line and be willing to support your, or in academia, your colleagues who need your support to call out sexual violence they've experienced and be that safe place. Because um, when I was at university, I 
um, confided in a professor that I had faced pretty rampant sexual harassment, and he said, that's part of the experience. Um, when I told a, a, a male colleague who I thought could really help me, he said, well, what do you want me to do about it? And, and instead, the answer should be, who can I talk to for you to build your credibility? So I guess that's my really long-winded answer, is both call out your social groups by calling them in, and then secondarily, be the support to go to the person above you, and especially if you have white privilege or male privilege, put it on the line, because like you have that, and the person who's approaching you does not. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. <laughs> Thank you, Alison. And, and also, if, um, one of the earlier sessions was just talking about it could be small things, you know, but actually showing support, showing up, being there, and um, uh, and doing what you can. And Laura Bates, um, in the first session this morning, shared some really fantastic examples of, um, of how to do that. Um, so thank you for the question. Uh, I think we are out of time, so I hope you'll join me in a really warm thanks to all of our generous speakers for sharing their uh, insights and thoughts today. Thank you. Thank you.